Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. December 1st, 2022, the Is Anti-Semitism Back edition. I'm David Plotz of CityCast in Washington, D.C. I'm joined by Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School from New Haven, Connecticut. Hello, Emily. Hey, David. And still powerful, his intellect not shaken, John Dickerson of CBS Primetime. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here, although I feel like I am only one cell more than the basic minimum definition for a functioning human at this moment. This week on the GabFest, why did Trump have dinner with Ye and the anti-Semitic white nationalist rabble rouser Nick Fuentes? I was trying to think of other disparaging terms for Nick Fuentes, and I thought, well, I'll just leave it there. Then why has China erupted in protest? We'll talk to beloved GabFest guest Sheena Chestnut Greitens about the zero COVID rebellion. Then the Senate passed a law protecting marriage equality. Will it protect marriage equality? Does marriage equality need protecting? Plus, of course, we will have cocktail chatter. And you have a, just a couple more days to get conundrums to us. We are going to have Allison Bechdel as our guest for our conundrum show, which will air at the end of December. And if you want to have a one last gasp, just get us your conundrums this weekend. Submit at slate.com slash conundrums. We have some really good ones, but maybe you have even better ones. I bet you do. Slate.com slash conundrums. This episode of the Gap Fest is sponsored by Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is the beach. It is also the perfect place to enjoy the holidays. At Myrtle Beach, you get all the holiday cheer you can handle, plus 60 miles of beaches and endless fun. There just aren't that many places where you can ring in the new year or celebrate the holidays with an ocean view. And this time of year, Myrtle Beach is amazing for horseback riding along the shoreline or fishing from chartered boats or in the intracoastal waterways or golfing at any of the 80 plus award winning courses. So take a holiday from the average holiday season at the beach. Plan your getaway to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at visitmyrtlebeach.com. If you were going to create an actual hell, for me at least, you literally could not come up with anything more horrifying than this. Donald Trump having dinner with Ye, the performer, obviously formerly known as Kanye West, and his close friend in anti-Semitism, the white nationalist rabble-rouser Nick Fuentes. Three people who all seem to have personality disorders, who are all incapable of silence, and you have to sit at dinner with them. It is an extremely unsurprising dinner, John, and yet it outraged people. Why? Who was offended by this? Why were they offended? Well, anyone in, in humanity <laughs> and who cares about it? I mean, well, because the beliefs that they hold are repugnant and um, disgusting, and because the sanction of the former president having dinner with them and the relative early silence of an entire political party about the easy elbow rubbing with uh, anti-Semites and white nationalists. And this these are not just stray comments. These are, you know, Ye is his own, and then Fuentes is way even further down the continuum of awfulness. Um, so it was just a gross, vulgar thing, and then the reaction to it kind of compounded it, um, or the lack of reaction, I guess I should say, at first. And also, I guess the third element of it would have been that it all seemed so familiar. Emily, who is Nick Fuentes, and why is he more despicable than Stephen Miller or Stephen Bannon or Roger Stone or Ye or any of the other ghouls that Trump waltzes around with? I mean, I guess he's more despicable. He's made anti-Semitism and white nationalism his main platform, I would say. And he talks about them in this very virulent way. And mostly, though, I felt in preparing for this segment that I was reading about a whole bunch of people who just crawled out from under a rock and were a kind of completely screechy version of some of the same themes of, you know, anti-immigration and, um, you know, basically white supremacy, particular kind of white people supremacy that we did get tastes of from Stephen Miller. I mean, I think you could put Tucker Carlson into this package as well. And I felt really resentful that I was having to think about all of this and worry about it. And I do wonder right now about a kind of mainstreaming of anti-Semitism. You know, my general feeling about anti-Semitism 
as a Jewish person in the United States is that it's not the main or a main ill that we face right now, that Jews are in a fairly comfortable space for the most part in the U.S., and I get uncomfortable with overemphasizing it because I worry that more disadvantaged groups are more deserving of that kind of attention, and I don't like Jews kind of taking up too much of that space, and sometimes it seems a little, like, paranoid to me, but I'm starting to revise my views on this because I'm starting to feel like we really are having a creeping into the mainstream discourse, these ideas that are responsible for many, many people's deaths and, you know, other suffering over the centuries. And, you know, some historians and political scientists are starting to compare the rhetoric to 1930s Germany. And look, like, obviously, there are many steps between us and what ended up happening to Jews in Europe. But I I don't I don't want to take like even I don't want to even put a toe down that path. I would note that I think that Fuentes is an equal op- opportunity racist and that he is certainly anti-Semitic and that is the main a theme. But he's also an incredibly racist white nationalist. So if I were a black American, I would feel perturbed that that Trump were meeting was meeting with him. Um I, in a way, like, I guess I feel like that tr- it's Trump's meeting with him that is the story, right? Fuentes has been around. He's been traveling around with Ye for Ye's uh, purported 2024 presidential campaign. And so it's not that Fuentes has been invisible. Fuentes has been around. And it's that Trump meets with him. And I kind of feel like actually Trump meeting with him is a sign of Trump's incredible weakness. That Trump, when Trump was president and when even when Trump was running he winked a lot at these people he was he was absolutely winking at them and he welcomed them because he would welcome anybody but he didn't have them in the room i think if you know the his daughter who is jewish probably uh, tempered some of those worst instincts and i think he they are in the room now with him because he's so desperate for accolades and appreciation he's not getting them from the, his usual sources because he's just not as popular in the republican party as he was six months or a year ago and that's so in a way i feel like this is this is a desperation from trump rather than it reflects some surge of fuentes this looks like this the first step in a familiar path to normalization um, which gets back to your point, Emily. Um, and normalization doesn't, you know, we saw it happen. I mean, good Donald Trump ran for president in 2016 on the lie that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, which is like straight up out of Jim Crow racist, you know, you must, there must be some trick to why you're succeeding if you're a black person in America. You must be cheating somehow. I mean, that's just straight up uh, from the racist playbook. And then in 20, you know, 16, Trump said that he couldn't be judged fairly by a Mexican, a judge of Mexican heritage, which Paul Ryan said was a textbook case of racism. Mitch McConnell said that Trump's seeming ambivalence about David Duke and the KKK was reprehensible. And yet Trump got elected. So all those things were normalized. Um, and, and the next step in normalization is when groups are demonized, you get free floating, um, unstable people take matters into their own hands um, and uh, start committing violence on these groups that are being targeted by um, some but, of these voices. But I guess I would say, John, that we've already passed that stage. Like, what you think? I don't think that the the Fuentes meeting represents a further normalization. I think we already had. We've already seen violence against Jews, violence against uh, immigrants, the demonization of of uh, Mexican Americans that that. Trump practice. I would argue normalization is a is an ongoing process. It is refreshed by the uh, c- continued acquiescence by people who know better, um, and it's both specifically norm continually normalized in this context, and then more broadly, it normalizes the idea that there are no rules, that racism, sexism, anti semitism, treason against the country, uh, they're all just like can be defined down. I mean, this week we had the leader of the Oath Keepers sentenced for seditious conspiracy for doing something the Republican Party called legitimate political discourse. That's another kind of normalization. So it's both the specific normalization, which keeps getting refreshed, and then the more broad normalization, which is if Donald Trump does it, 
we rally around him because we must protect him and because he's the center of this party. So I think that's I think it gets refreshed. But I guess I don't feel like that what's happened with Fuentes is a refreshing of it. I feel like it is that it that it is signaling that Trump is is it is a more troubled and peripheral figure in the party. Otherwise, but I guess we don't know that maybe. yet, yeah, right. right? Like you're jumping a few steps called the primaries and the voters haven't weighed in and he still polls well among Republicans. So I feel like you're assuming some facts that we don't know to be true yet. If I was sure that he was off to the margins and was about to get, you know, 5% or 10% of the Republican primary vote, I would share your confidence. But we don't know that, right? And also, I think we don't know necessarily the power he still has among those who both follow him and then seek to take action when they feel like his um, he's he is being thwarted. I mean, so that when Trump does these things and when then there and when there is no sanction, then like this free floating energy gets out there, which I think we've seen has, you know, can be very dangerous. And it's not just Trump. It's other it's all the voices in this category. And. One more thing just about the particular tropes of racism, anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant. They're following the incredibly well-worn grooves of how you other people, right? The Jews are the powerful ones who are accused of having control in this various way. Um, Other groups are seen as like bad because they're taking jobs or they're downtrodden or all the usual bad racist ideas. And it's just depressing to see that having another moment in the culture in which like we have to think about all of that and that it gets attention. There's no way to cover this without explaining who Fuentes is. And then you have to reproduce some of his views. And, you know, along with the other cast of characters he travels around with and Ye is his whole own problem, right? Like we, I can't tell what his mental state really is, how much to hold him responsible for what he's doing. But he's a huge, huge star. And he's saying these like terrible things. And the notion that nobody is listening to him and it doesn't matter. I just doubt it. What do you guys make of a few Jewish Republicans, Jewish Republicans who have been staunch Trump supporters because of generally his extremely pro the right wing and Israel policies uh, saying slightly more critical stuff this week. Did you did you feel like there's an actual uh, fissure there, Emily? I mean, it seemed like pretty weak tea to me. And I think the people who have been willing to go along with this from the beginning are a little more likely to try to peel back because Trump does seem to be less powerful and they have less to gain from their point of view in terms of pro-Israel policy. But it was always a bargain with the devil. And... um You know, the fact that they stuck around for so much of it, it just is already such a problem. Of course, we do bonus segments on the GabFest for Slate Plus members. You can become a member by going to slate.com slash GabFest Plus. You get so much with your Slate Plus membership, including member exclusive episodes and segments from us and other shows like Slow Burn, which is Apple's podcast of the year. Slow Burn was and Amicus, and you get no ads on any podcasts and unlimited reading on the Slate site, as well as the satisfaction of supporting Slate's journalism. Today, uh, our bonus segment is going to be about the challenge at the Supreme Court to the Biden administration's policy on enforcing immigration law. The Biden administration had a new policy to enforce immigration law, and it's been challenged, and now the Supreme Court is weighing that challenge. Go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus to become a member today. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Brooklinen. Holidays, gift buying time, check out Brooklinen. Brooklinen does two things for you in the holiday season. A, it can make you a great holiday host. So if you're having guests staying with you over the holidays, what better way to greet them than with lovely, luscious Brooklinen linens, Brooklinen sheets. I had my kids in the other day. My daughter was sleeping and she had to sleep on the couch, but it was no problem because she was sleeping on a couch that was that was paved, that was beautifully garnished with Brooklyn and sheets that are so comfortable and so cozy and she loves them and she slept like a baby, although she is no longer a baby. And if you want to get a great gift, Brooklyn is the way to go. They have luxurious home essentials that feel as good as they look and they offer something for everyone. You can get amazing accessories there or forever favorites that make a house a home. And they go way beyond bedding. They have an expanded collection of home fragrance, cozy robes, 
and all the bathroom essentials to make an oasis right at home. On top of all the coziness on the horizon, Brooklyn is offering something extra special for first-time customers. If you visit Brooklyn today, you'll save 15% on your first purchase plus free shipping. That's B R O O K L I N E N dot com for 15% off your first purchase plus free shipping. The GAFest is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash gabfest. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash gabfest. We are delighted to be joined by uh, GabFest regular Sheena chestnut Greitens. Sheena is associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at University of Texas, where she directs UT's Asia Policy Program. Uh, Sheena, welcome back to the GabFest. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. Why have protests broken out across China and why did zero COVID spark them? This is a set of protests that are really unusual in terms of, you know, what we've seen in in China during the zero COVID period. The trigger for this particular wave of protests was a fire in Xinjiang that left um, officially about a dozen people dead, um, although there are reports that the death toll may have been higher. And that's the that's the official number that we've been given. Um, And what's really unique about this set of protests is that this specific incident really seemed to resonate with people all across China. And so we've seen protests that have crossed boundaries of location, right? Multiple provinces and cities across China. Um, They've crossed class boundaries. So we've seen not just students, 80-some universities participating, but also older people, people from middle class and and working workers. Um, And then also we've seen some cross-ethnic solidarity and mobilization. So people expressing sympathy for those in Xinjiang, um, which during a period where Xinjiang's been subject to really intense repression, both for zero COVID purposes, but also just widespread political repression. Um, you know, we haven't seen that kind of sympathy expressed towards Xinjiang specifically before. That's something the party's worked really hard to avoid for the past decade and has set up a whole internal security system to try to prevent. And so to see multiple points of failure in that system simultaneously must be really concerning to party authorities in Beijing, but also is just an indication of probably some really widespread latent dissatisfaction with how long the zero COVID policy in China's lasted. One thing that strikes me about the zero COVID policy is that it's been very successful in preventing death. It has also lasted far beyond other most other countries' super restrictive measures. And it's taken place with, I think, relatively low vaccination rates because China has not wanted to import mRNA vaccines. I have to say, in reading about all the surveillance and security that goes into enforcing this policy, I get this creepy feeling where I wonder if there's a hidden agenda here or just another agenda in which um, the Chinese regime is habituating people to being to giving up all of their privacy, to having their movements constricted, to having just incredible level of state control that is possible in this world of surveillance and facial recognition software and QR codes that China is bringing into being. And I wonder what you think about that kind of underlying connections and possibilities. One of the things that's that's been um, really puzzling, frankly, about China's uh, management of the zero COVID policy is that this is a state that is clearly comfortable using draconian controls in other parts of its its management of the pandemic, and yet it hasn't forced citizens to get vaccinated. And so part of the issue, the conundrum that, that the party faces right now um, is that they have low vaccination rates, especially among some of their highest risk populations um, in among the elderly, 
They don't have an effective mRNA vaccine. My understanding is that their attempts to develop vaccines haven't kept pace with the um, speed with which we've seen new variants in the virus. And so they're in this really tough situation from their standpoint where they've got a choice between relaxing and potentially having a, a very large infection and death toll. Um, and they've really hinged their legitimacy on, you know, China hasn't had the kind of, of spikes in infection and death rates that, that they've, that they, you know, they tell citizens, look, we've seen these in other countries. Um, and so they've really hinged their legitimacy on this. And I think it's possible that they look at this and say, well, even these protests and this unrest are better than what we think we'd get if we relax zero COVID because we'd have so many people die and our whole model would, would fall apart. But in the meantime, that's an incredibly costly model. And as you point out, one of the things that they've done is use the surveillance state that Xi Jinping had already started developing prior to COVID. But the pandemic gave them a really good reason to strengthen all of these surveillance tools and all of these social tools in the name of public health and say, hey, citizens, we're doing this for you. Um, the problem now is that uh, because they've used those tools for prevention and control of the pandemic, um, but also of social unrest, now what you may get is people who are pushing back on these as pandemic controls saying, yeah, we don't want this at all. It didn't, it's not doing anything for us. You told us this was for us. And that's not what we're seeing. That's not what we're experiencing here on the ground. So it's it's not just about the bargain that the party struck over, hey, you're going to have to sacrifice, but we're going to do better on COVID in the long term, right? That that very specific bargain on, on COVID management and pandemic management is breaking down. But it's also that this risks undermining the legitimacy of the whole sort of architecture of social control and social stability that Xi Jinping has spent a decade building. And that's been a cornerstone of of the way he's framed his legacy. What's the breaking point? So there's the protests and and but those presumably can be shut down. But if everybody's shut up in their houses, obviously, that's going to have an economic impact in addition to the social backlash it's causing. So what's your sense of where this comes um, cause it looks like the, the response to all of this is just to squeeze the bar of soap harder. What could the possible breaking point be either in terms of the economy or other, uh, other ways that zero COVID and the response to these backlashes could hurt China? You know, to be honest, I think the party state will probably make it through this and the security apparatus will probably make it through this. Um, the tools that Xi Jinping has developed, uh, for prevention and control, which is their, sort of catchphrase, both for pandemic management and for managing domestic instability and, and protest and unrest. That whole model of, of prevention and control, it's designed to prevent unrest from occurring, right? And so what we're seeing is multiple points of failure in that, that model all across the country right now. But it is also really useful retroactively. And we're already seeing these reports from journalists on the ground about how all of these videos that protesters put up that the censors originally were really struggling to manage, right? There's this flood of video content from the protests. Censors can't keep up. The censorship regime is aimed at trying to demobilize people. Um, and that wasn't working very well initially. But with time and the ability to, you know, use AI and write algorithms to identify protesters, even when they're wearing masks, um, you know, the state can, can now go back and identify who was there. It doesn't just call them, right? it doesn't just call the protesters, it calls their family, it calls their bosses. And it uses what we call relational repression, right, to leverage social connections, because I might be willing to go take a risk and protest for myself. But if I'm putting my elderly mother at risk of going to jail, that for most people, that's not just a different sort of strategic calculation, it's a different moral question. And the Chinese state is really effective at, at leveraging that. So to be honest, I think, um, you know, we've seen a period where we've seen a lot of mobilization and sort of momentum on the side of citizens and protesters. Unfortunately, I think we're about to see the pendulum start swinging back and the state use some of these tools to crack down and regain control. Literally, what is the consequence for a protester who is identified by by the government and is and they get contacted? What is then likely to happen to that person or to their family? Well, it can be a range of consequences depending on their history. If this is somebody who has a history of petitioning or complaining about political authority, challenging um, the government, then they can get listed in what the regime calls targeted populations or targeted people. Um, and that means that they're subject to special monitoring. Um, there are local neighborhood committees 
that are then tasked to keep an eye on them. Um, sometimes that's public security and police, but sometimes it's it's just your sort of local neighborhood committee, um, which is a more civil organization that does a lot of, of neighborhood management. And people will then often be um, you know, confined to their houses in advance of a sensitive anniversary. So this time next year, the anniversary of this fire in Xinjiang, um, they might take all the people who uh, they've identified as, especially as ringleaders or organizers or important focal points of the protest, and just tell them, you're going to stay in your house, um, effectively house arrest, for the next week. Just to make sure you don't go anywhere and you don't organize anybody. And by the way, we've put this app on your cell phone, so we know if you do anything digitally as well. So that's probably the the likely consequence. For people who are really involved in leading or organizing, there could be more formal charges. What my read right now is that local authorities and the central authorities are still kind of figuring out how to frame and how to handle the protests that have emerged. We've seen some effort to blame local authorities, which is a very common thing for the central government to do. Like, oh, we didn't mean for the policy to be implemented that way. It's terrible that they did that for to you. We're going to, you know, remove them, maybe charge them with a, a crime or subject them to party discipline. We're on your side, right? The trouble is that's hard to do in this case because zero COVID is so clearly tied to the central government and to Xi Jinping. Um, but in the meantime, what I would I would expect is certainly some pretty stringent monitoring of people who are involved and especially the organizers of anything um, and maybe some more severe consequences like charges or imprisonment. I find all of this so chilling. And then there are these images of people holding up blank sheets of paper as a way of protesting censorship, but also trying to protect themselves or chanting or saying in protests, I'm not saying anything. There's a kind of... Um, voicelessness or a effort to have a voice without um, voicing the specific complaints or or at least going beyond the zero COVID um, complaints. And it just makes you feel like this is, there's so much sheer power behind this regime. And that um, it just must be so costly to people to be part of these protests. It feels like such a difficult position to take in China. Um, even if, as you're saying, the state hasn't completely worked out what all the consequences are going to be, it just seems so unlikely that people will be able to really shake the regime, although maybe they will get some changes to zero COVID that could provide some relief. Is is that right? I mean, is that how you see these protests? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a really sobering display of the state's ability to to be arbitrary in its authority in a way that has profound impacts on people's lives up to and including, you know, people dying in an, in an apartment fire um, or, you know, all of the costs of being confined to your apartment for weeks at a time, the economic cost that, that this has exerted on the, the Chinese economy, um, which has lots of implications for ordinary families and ordinary people in China. Um, you know, in terms of the protesters holding up blank paper, and the sort of back and forth that we've seen of trying to protest in ways that will be harder either for censors to identify or for police to get upset about. Um, there's a long tradition in China of kind of this cat and mouse game of putting up memes that will get around censors. For a while, people used, you know, images and pictures when text was um, was more heavily censored as the algorithms have gotten better at figuring out how to catch pictures that are politically inflammatory or provocative. Um, you know, people have, they use um, homonyms and double meanings, which the Chinese language has a lot of and, and can really facilitate. So there's lots of, there's this long, rich history of protesters um, and people sort of mocking state authority or making jokes about about those in political power or pol political policies, um, and, but trying to do it in a way that's not going to bring heavy consequences down on them. And so in some ways, what we see is just a testament to the ingenuity of the Chinese people right? Time after time. And, you know, one of the, the things that I appreciated was this, there's this video that was making the rounds of somebody saying, well, we have to be careful that this isn't, this isn't something that foreign forces are, are doing to destabilize China. And, you know, the protesters said, look, like, what foreign forces? We can't talk to anyone outside of China. We can't leave. Um, you talking about Marx? Are you talking about Lenin? Like what, what foreign forces? Come on. Um, and just the, the pushback in, in that, com, you know, sort of, socialist context was was very clever and also um, 
uh, very poignant um, because that's that's one of the state's sort of go-to moves is to blame any d- popular dissatisfaction on foreign instigators. And and this is one of the first times I've seen protesters explicitly say, yeah, no, that's not what's going on here. We're just not happy with the policy. But you're right. I think there is. There's a, you know, there's, it's very easy to measure the impact on growth and the way that the Chinese economy has paid a price for the zero COVID policy. It is, I think, harder to see the impact on um, you know, just ordinary human life. Um, we do see it in, in people seeking to leave China. There is some data on that, but that sort of intangible and personal loss is that human cost is, is harder to measure, but I think very real. And that's part of what's bringing people out into the streets. Sheena chestnut Greitens of the University of Texas. Thanks, as always, for coming on the GabFest. Thanks for having me. This episode is sponsored by Aura Frames. Here is a great idea to spread more joy this holiday season and just to take care of your gifting situation, Aura Frames for everyone. It's actually what I am literally doing this season. Aura was named the best digital picture frame by Wirecutter and The Strategist, and they are the perfect way to keep all of your favorite faces in one beautiful place. I adore my Aura Frame. I adore it. It is sitting right above me. I look at it all the time. I have it set to change photos every five minutes or so. So whenever I kind of glance up from work, there is a new photo and sometimes a a little video that's playing uh, or sometimes an image of just an image of something my kids drew. Maybe it's wonderful. You connect your Aura Frame to Wi-Fi, use the free Aura app, which is very easy to use to add endless pictures and videos from anywhere in the world. You can invite your friends and family onto the app and have them comment and heart and send new photos to your frame. And you can even preload it with your favorite photo. So I gave an aura frame to my mom the other day and I preloaded it with photos. And so it was all set up for her and it just, there it was. It was amazing. Save on the perfect gift. You can get $30 off Aura's best-selling frames. If you go to auraframes.com slash gabfest, that's A-U-R-A frames.com slash gabfest. These frames have been selling out every December, so get yours now before they're all gone. Terms and conditions apply. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by Slotomania. Life is too short for a day without fun. So get a thrill whenever you need it with Slotomania, the world's number one free slots game. You'll have endless excitement at your fingertips with 170 free-to-play slot games, huge jackpots, an interactive community, and a million free coins. It's the perfect escape from your daily routine. Slotomania gives you the thrill of slots from the palm of your hand. They have hundreds of original Vegas style and video slot machines ready to play wherever you are. It's like a Vegas vacation without the luggage. So you can start having fun right away. There's no insider knowledge or strategies required. And they add new features every day, including fun mini games and your very own pet cheetah named Aurora. So join the biggest community of slot lovers in the world. When your day is feeling stale, just ask. What will today spin? If you're 21 or older, you can join millions of players around the world. Download Slotomania, the number one free slots game, on the App Store or Google Play Store and get 1 million free coins. That's Slotomania on the App Store or Google Play Store for 1 million free coins. You think your job stinks? Just wait till you hear what it was like to be a funeral clown. Long before all of human knowledge was in your pocket, people had some pretty bizarre professions. Luckily, you don't have to see a sin eater or barber surgeon now, but you'll find out what it's like to get surgery with a shave if you listen to Wondery's new podcast, This Job is History. This Job is History is hosted by Chris Parnell from Saturday Night Live and Rick and Morty, and it delves into the quirky and absurd jobs from the past with hilarious interviews that are infused with fascinatingly true Easter eggs. You'll get weird each week with improv comedians from the Groundlings and UCB as they act out old-fashioned gigs from another time. You will be so glad your guidance counselor didn't recommend any of these jobs for you. Clock in and follow This Job is History on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. The Respect for Marriage Act passed a procedural vote in the Senate with more than 60 votes, and it will presumably pass an actual vote in the Senate and presumably then also be affirmed by the House, which needs to deal with it, the lame duck Democratic House, and it will be signed by President Biden, one presumes. The law, if it passes, does a couple of things. First of all, it, it repeals the Defense of Marriage Act 
the law that that barred same-sex marriage back in the 90s. Second, it would compel states to recognize same-sex marriages from other states, even if the Supreme Court overturns its ruling legalizing gay marriage. So the Obergefell uh, ruling by the Supreme Court, which made gay marriage legal uh, across the country, if it the Supreme Court decides, oh, that's no longer law, there are 32 states that still have laws against uh, same-sex marriage on the books. What the new Respect for Marriage law would, would say was, you might not be able to get married in those states which have those laws on the books, but you could go to another state, you could leave Alabama and go to New York, get married, come back, and Alabama would have to recognize your marriage. Your marriage would still be a legitimate marriage in Alabama. And third, the law provides some protections for religious organizations that do not want to conduct same-sex marriages or be associated with them, and it would, it would free them from any sort of legal censure for that. So is this law a moral triumph or a cowardly, weak capitulation to the Supreme Court and to religious zealots? Emily? I'm going to go with moral triumph. I mean, there are aspects of this law that are a political compromise. As you just laid out, the Congress is relying on the full faith and credit clause in the Constitution and kind of emphasizing that and saying that states must recognize each other's marriages rather than requiring all 50 states to perform same-sex weddings and grant licenses for them. I think what's super important about this is that lawmakers will vote for this right. It will not be one that we merely rely on the Supreme Court for. And I've been thinking about this a lot within the context of abortion. If you just have one part of our separations of powers that you're relying on a right for, that can turn out to be weaker than you thought. And you never go through the process of democratically elected representatives um, taking a vote, explaining why they support this, building um, a kind of more participatorial sense of democratic decision making around an important change in American law and practice. And this accomplishes that from the point of view of Congress. And the fact that you have 11 or so Republicans, dozen Republicans going along with this and voting for it is also really important as a show of bipartisan support. So for all these reasons, I think it's important. So if it goes through the democratic process, you get diversity of input, right? So in a, in laws that have to govern in a large, sprawling country with lots of different people, you have lots, you have representatives from all over the country adding their voice, which is something that you have to have in such a big country, country. And that therefore makes it less brittle, right? Because presumably, because the law went through this process and voices were heard, while people may be disappointed, they don't feel shut out. Is there, is A, do you agree? And B, is there other... Are there other salutary benefits that uh, come from this process? I very much agree, and I think those are the main benefits. I also think ha having a record that people in both parties support this outcome is very valuable. And you don't have the whole set of accusations that, oh, it was nine people or five people in black robes who aren't elected who made this huge call for the country. Do you think it is a big deal, either of you, that the act protects religious institutions that want to not have to deal with same-sex marriages, not have to do them, not have to be associated with them, not have to support them. Um, and it, it basically protects them from any legal punishment or lawsuit. Is that, is that, I mean, it, it, this would not be tolerable if we were talking about interracial marriage. You could never pass a law that said we can't, you can't do this if, for interracial marriages. Um, but is this oh, a, I'm a not reasonable? Sure that's true at all. You think you, you think you could, pass a law that said churches don't have to do interracial marriages? I think a nonprofit, well, it's a little complicated because a there is one ruling. A religious a, nonprofit couldn't have to serve interracial couples? I think that religious organizations have a very strong um, freedom of religion, religious liberty claim that kicks in in these cases. Now, there is one precedent in which a religious school lost its tax exempt status um, for not for having rules against interracial dating, if I'm recalling that case Bob correctly. Bob Jones, yeah. Bob Jones. So you're probably right. Um, and I think also it would be politically intolerable, or at least you might be right. But with this Supreme Court and how strongly it supports religious liberty principles, um, it seems to me that in the context of same-sex marriage, if not really anything goes, that churches, synagogues, mosques, et cetera, already have this right, essentially. Right. right. And so I don't think this is a big deal at all. So it's Before, about a reality. Yes. And also, uh, just think, if you're an activist um, in life 
and you want change, don't you want a world in which more of the change comes as a result of legislation than through Supreme Courts? I mean, I think there's a lot of reason to think that you're right about that. And it's been a great insight of the same-sex marriage movement for 25 years, right? I mean, the first ruling was in Massachusetts. It was the Massachusetts Supreme Court, not a federal court. Then you have a mix of state court rulings, state ballot initiatives, state legislation, and federal court rulings. And all of that lays the groundwork for Obergefell. Obergefell doesn't just, like, come out of nowhere, and I think it was really important. Um, This is a very former President Obama point to be making. He was interested in this idea that social change should come out of the democracy more than the courts. And I always think about him in this context because, you know, he went to Harvard Law School. Like, he understands all, all the reasons why courts often get kind of lionized in legal settings when there are lots of people who in law school who care about the courts. And then as someone who, you know, was an organizer, I think he really in a lot of ways saw the value of this kind of change as being better. But Emily, am I you you just gave a little pocket history of that. But my memory of that was that almost and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that almost every one of the thing the moves that made gay marriage more legal in more states was a was court. Well, actually, no. There was legislation passed by several states, including uh, New York, Delaware, New Hampshire, Vermont. There were ballot initiatives that passed before Obergefell in Maine and Maryland in Washington. And then state court decisions in states, including Iowa and New Mexico and New Jersey. So you saw all the branches of government and all parts of our federal system involved in legalizing same-sex marriage before the Supreme Court stepped in. Can I also, from the conservative point of view, uh, still ringing in my mind is the history of being in the Roosevelt Room when George W. Bush announced in 2004 that he was going to promote a constitutional amendment to um, protect marriage, as he said at the time. In other words, a constitutional amendment making same-sex marriage unconstitutional, Um, which there's this position that, um, you know, uh, that unless... Uh, Republicans support the marginal rights issue of the moment. Nothing in the past um, can be um, described as having changed for the Republican Party. But it is notable that from 2004, you have a leader of the Republican Party offering this constitutional amendment. And now you had 12 Republicans in the Senate voting for this. That's that's a change. Um, And obviously also the change to the Democratic Party. I mean, the Defense of Marriage Act won 342 to 67 in the House and was obviously supported by Bill Clinton. So anyway, just as a marker of of, um, cultural change. But if you're a conservative, don't you also want this to go through the legislature? If you were one of those ones who said we don't want people in black robes determining things. I was just thinking Marco Rubio during the summer when this was being debated said it was a stupid waste of time. And that might have been a political reaction. He might have thought they were bringing it up to hurt Republicans in the election. But if you're a conservative, don't you also want this to go through the legislature? I mean, it depends what kind of conservative you are, because you're really talking about being against judicial activism, we might say, or judicial supremacy, the idea of the courts playing the main role. And I would say that now that the Supreme Court is firmly in conservative hands, I don't (laughs) hear so much about that anymore. Emily, do you think there's a real threat to Obergefell? I cannot imagine Kavanaugh or Roberts or even Gorsuch voting to overturn it. I don't think so. I still think this was an important thing to do. Right. No, I, that is a separate question. Yeah, you I'm, you're not arguing why that is. Yeah. yeah. Um, John, what other lame duck legislation awaits in the wings? Is there going to be an Electoral Count Act reform? Is there going to be anything else that are we going to raise the debt ceiling to 15 Googleplex dollars? I can't remember where we are at this immediate moment on the Electoral Count Act um, because, well, because I just can't. But I think it depends both that and your question about the debt limit mat- depend on how quickly they can come to an agreement about funding the government, um, because the longer that takes, the less time there is to do other things. And um, I, ge- I would be surprised if they fix the debt limit question at all. Um, so, uh, but I might be wrong. And we, another thing we should throw in there is that Donald Trump's tax returns are now with the House Ways and Means Committee, um, which... Um, 
is, you know, after a long, long, long court battle, the Democrats who control the House Ways and Means Committee now have between now and when Congress is gone to take a look at at Donald Trump's tax returns, which um, could provide some fascinating material. Let's go to cocktail chatter when you are lame duckly sitting in your house. You're having a lame a lame duck family session. What are you going to be chattering about? with your little ducks, Emily, who are all big. You have big ducks. <laughs> I have big ducks. I am so excited about the salad dressing ideas and recipes that GabFest listeners sent us. This is just a veritable cornucopia of salad dressing solutions involving ingredients like, um, well, tahini's not exotic, but still exciting to me. Tamari, uh, nutritional yeast, mayonnaise, soy sauce, um, rice vinegar, just so many good thoughts and combinations here. I have made some of them. I am going to make more of them, and we are going to post them so that um, all of you can also enjoy these suggestions. And thank you so much to everybody who wrote in. Um, I liked the notes I got. Things like pomegranate molasses is widely available at Middle Eastern grocery stores. And suggestions for superior kinds of tahini to purchase, which I actually went and got. Anyway, um, enjoy. I am enjoying. New Haven woman excited by tahini. Exactly. John, what's your chatter? Uh, My chatter is um, about a study that was done by... um, well, actually, it's a it's an article about a study in something called theconversation.com, which I enjoy. It's um, but the, and it's written by two of the authors of the study, Darby Saxby and Magdalena uh, Martinez Garcia. And th- what they studied was the um, was the question of whether men's brains change in fatherhood. It is there is established research research that shows that um, mothers uh, undergoing uh, or pregnant mothers have their brains change. Um, and what they wanted to check and see is whether men's brains change during um, fatherhood. And it turns out um, they do. Um, and what it appears to be is that essentially um, this creates uh, the, the new experience of having a child creates uh, brain plasticity. Um and that that's essentially a version of the same thing that happens when you take up a new language or learn a new instrument or take up quilting or something. Whenever you're trying something that's brand new, that that forces you to develop new um, uh, capabilities, your brain actually becomes more plastic and able to do those things. So childbirth apparently is in this um, category. That's really interesting. I wonder how you weigh that against the general exhaustion and fatigue that being a parent imposes on you because exhaustion and fatigue make you brittle and make you less, you know, your brain less agile and your mind less agile. And I wonder how, where those two things come into balance. You could look at the brain changes, which they study the actual change in the gray matter of somebody who was, um, uh, had a child versus one, someone who was just sleep deprived. Yeah. I it's think, also, actually but it might there, be the combination. I think too. there might be other research, David, that su- addresses the issue you're raising. A friend of mine was just talking about this recently and making the argument um, that this is an important support for a test of parenting in custody disputes or guardianship cases that involves the actual act of parenting as opposed to a biological connection for a child for with a child, because um, it shows the effect on like the parenting itself has these important knock on effects. My chatter, two, first a quick one, uh, just usual CityCast promo, which is we come to Madison. We have launched CityCast Madison, and we're doing a daily podcast in Madison, Wisconsin. Well, it's not quite daily yet because we're starting a little slowly twice a week for now, but it's wonderful. It's hosted by Bianca Martin, who's just a, a Boolean delight. Uh, please check it out, madison.citycast.fm. But my real chatter is about a really interesting op-ed in the New York Times by Nicole Eustace, who's a history professor at NYU. And it's about a treaty I'd never heard of, the Great Treaty of 1722. Emily, is, why are you cheering? Why are you, why are you raising your hands cheerfully above your head, Emily? It's a, it was a really good piece. And it's never heard of it. This isn't a treaty signed between um, the indigenous nations known as the 
and forgive me if I don't pronounce this correctly, Haudenosaunee Confederacy and three British colonies in 1722. Um, in Albany, New York, they signed a treaty in, about a murder that had taken place where a Seneca hunter was murdered by a pair of white fur traders, John and Edmund Catledge, two white fur traders. And the, the Indian tribes involved demanded, well, there was a, they demanded restorative justice, and they also demanded that the killers go free, that they did not want the killers to die for having murdered uh, one of their own. And it's it's a pretty complicated story. Uh, and also there's an interesting kind of cover up because the the British colonies never wanted the true story about what happened in these negotiations to get out. But it's an example of how restorative justice was woven into the fabric of this original treaty that the U.S. signed. And it's the oldest treaty that the United States still acknowledges. Uh, and it's just a fascinating story. You know, I'm worried that I don't uh, promote my own show enough, as as I uh, hear you mentioning CityCast. Do you want to say something? Have you gone to Madison this week? No, I haven't. But I we are on Paramount Plus now, both uh, live oh, at seven. Yeah, there we live go. at seven, and in the uh, news section, you can find us, or you just search for John Dickerson and or John. Listeners, you continue to send chatters to us, really good ones this week. Woof. Great, great ones. You can email us at gabfest at slate.com or tweet them to us at, at slategabfest uh, and something you're chattering about. And Richard Meadlicott has our chatter this week. Richard Meadlicott here from New Zealand. I was reading The Economist recently and came across an article that in these days of doom scrolling and cynicism about democracy, it was just uplifting. It was the obituary for Shyam Saran Niki, aged 105, who was the first voter in independent India. It's a story about how he first voted all those years ago, following through many years and then finishing with his most recent um, exercising of democracy. So if you want a great story about positive things and about how important democracy is, then please uh, find the story and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. That's our show for today. The Gab Fest is produced by Shana Roth, our researchers, Bridget Dunlap. Our theme music is by They Might Be Giants, Ben Richmond, Senior Director for Podcast Operations, Alicia Montgomery, VP of Audio for Slate. Please follow us on Twitter at, at SlateGabFest. Tweet your chatter to us there. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next week. Hello, Slate Plus. How are you? Uh, super interesting, probably case that will depress me when its outcome comes. No, it's, it's just, I was saying, it's like a really interesting case, but I was like, I don't, I don't really like where I think this case is going, but maybe it, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Emily, tell us about the immigration case that the Supreme court heard argued on Tuesday. Yeah. So this is a challenge to a policy that the Biden administration put in place that prioritizes certain groups of unauthorized immigrants for arrest and deportation. Basically, um, as many uh, government officials have done before him, the current secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorka, said, OK, we acknowledge that we can't deport all of the more than 11 million unauthorized immigrants in the country. And so we're going to prioritize three groups, suspected terrorists, people who have committed crimes and people who have re recently been caught at the border. Seems pretty commonsensical. But Texas and Louisiana went to court in Texas to challenge this policy, and they deliberately uh, chose a district where they knew they would get a recent Trump appointee judge who they thought presumably would be sympathetic to their arguments. This is called forum shopping, and um, conservative litigants have been doing a lot of it lately in Texas. I don't know how interesting I really think this is, because to me, this seems very obvious that the government has has to exercise prosecutorial discretion in the context of law enforcement. That is true for federal immigration officials and also for state and local officials. And I thought that it seemed like most of the Supreme Court justices 
got that pretty basic point, and we're not going to go along with what seems to me to be kind of grandstanding by Texas and Louisiana. Uh, but I guess we'll see. What did you guys think? I thought I um, thought Emily, there was that the everything you say may in fact be true, but that the, one of the things at issue was that there was language in the authorizing legislation that was more specific and suggested that the characters or the 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 constraints or the the rules for um, adjudicating claims were in the actual legislation that there was shall language in the legislation that ruled and that that limited the discretion of the executive branch. Yes, you're totally right about that. It, the statutes do say shall. However, many previous court decisions in other contexts, including immigration, have recognized that Congress also controls how many resources the government has to execute a law, right? And so you can say shall deport every single person, but if you don't, like, that's an impossible task. And so that's where prosecutorial discretion kicks in, not just as a practical matter, but as a matter of legal doctrine. Or is it prosecutorial discretion or judges recognizing the world we live in, which is the point you just made, which is you can shall all day long, but if you provide no money for it, you can't have an executive branch on the hook for mandates. It's funny. It's like it's a it's a congressional mandate that they give them that they're not sufficiently serious about because they're not funding it and therefore that should lose the power of their shall. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I mean, it's basically judges opening the door, recognizing prosecutorial discretion as a necessary ingredient of of our separation of powers and the way of which the branches of government make and enforce laws. So the other two questions were, do they have standing to sue? And then does the single district court judge have standing, have have the right to set aside? That was just a snippet from our Slate Plus conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation Go to slate.com slash GabFestPlus to become a member today.